Good morning. It is so nice to have each and every one of you with us this morning as we continue in our study, our new study in Ecclesiastes. Today we're going to begin in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. So if you would, just grab your Bible off the shelf and, and open it up to Ecclesiastes. We were in Job last few weeks, and so you go further to the right, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and you'll be right there, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. We always want to start with a word of prayer. I would invite you and where you're sitting today, uh, whether that be in your home or, or wherever it may be, to know that God is there with you just as he is here with me this morning. And I'm going to lead us in prayer, but I invite you to, to pour out your heart to God for anything that might be troubling you, as we're told to do in the Bible. And I, and I pray that you would pray for people by name and, and specifically call them out in the place where you're at. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we praise your holy name and we thank you, Lord, for this privilege that we have to come into your presence this morning, to open your word in your presence, to, to speak the truth that's in your word. And Lord, we ask that, that as we do this, you would guide our hearts in understanding these scriptures and, and learning how you would have us to apply these, these timeless truths in our lives. Lord, we have many that we are concerned about this morning, uh, many who are sick, Lord, uh, many who have, have troubles that, that they cannot deal with, Lord, uh, relatives, neighbors, friends, Lord, we lift them up to you by name and prayer this morning. We know you hear all of our prayers, and we know that you answer all of our prayers. We thank you, Lord, for those answers that you give us each and every day. Lord, speak to us now. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In Ecclesiastes 1 and 2 last week, Solomon documented the futility that he found in his search for purpose and meaning in life. He tells us that he searched for meaning in intellectual pursuits. He searched for meaning in physical pleasure. He searched for meaning in accumulating possessions for himself. And he, he searched for meaning in, in personal achievement. So the question that we bring next is, so how can a person find fulfillment in life? Well, what we're going to learn in tonight's or to this morning's lesson is that first of all, we have to know what time it is. Our personal lives are generally, generally have four full seasons. Listen to me carefully. The spring of life is when we're young and we're maturing. The summer of life is when we are raising a family of our own, that when we're busy working on careers and, and getting somewhere in life. Fall is when the children leave home and parents have, a kind of, have to kind of start a new life with our careers winding down and becoming less personally active in life. And finally, winter comes when we are reaching the end of life on this earth. Oftentimes as people enter into this winter period or winter season of life, they deeply regret spending so much time and effort on their careers and so little time taking care of devoting more time to family, especially their children. When polled on this matter, people in the winter of life say that they would most like to, that would most like to have spent their time in the summer 
and the fall of life, number one, 55% say they would spend more time with their family. 9% would sleep more. What that means is they, they were tired, they were exhausted uh, following pursuing things and pursuing, and pursuing careers. 15% would work more around the house. In other words, try to upkeep the house better, do more work, yes, but not away from home, but at home. Okay? But 0% of these persons in the winter of life say they would spend more time on the job. There seems to be a difference between our real priorities in life and our desired priorities. We're going to be looking in, in Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8, first of all, where Ecclesiastes talks to us about the time that we're in in life and the place where we are. Verse number 1, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. The Hebrew word for purpose could also be, tra be translated activity or delight. Okay, so remember that. Purpose really could mean an, an activity. Okay, this refers to human purpose, not necessarily God's purpose. Okay, what we like to choose to do with our time is what this is talking about. The term under heaven is synonymous with the phrase that we looked at last week, under the sun. A general, it's a general reference to the full realm of activities in a human life on earth. Remember that God created time before he created people. The first division of time occurred in Genesis chapter 1 when God established days and then subdivided the days into mornings and evenings. Look at Genesis 1, 3 through 5. It reads, Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the, so the evening and the morning were the first day. Time is an important and integral part of God's creation. When God created people, he placed us in a world that was structured with time. Days, weeks, seasons that give meaning and purpose to our lives. In verses 1 through 8, it says to everything that God created, there's a season. Solomon lists 28 activities in opposing pairs to generalize the entire range of activities in a human lifetime. Life is finite in terms of a person's time on this earth. Hebrews 9.27 tells us that God has set a day for every person to die. God's design for creation subordinates people to live on this earth within the constraints of time. During a lifetime, each individual experiences an ample share of both the good and the bad or difficult seasons in life. A person must come to grips with each difficult situation in life in order to utilize the limited time in life to then effectively participate in and enjoy the good things or the fulfilling things in life, the things that we want. Look at verses 2 through 4. It says, A time to be born and a time to die. 
A time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. Let's look first at that first phrase in verse 2. It says, a time to give birth and a time to die. Everything in a person's life accomplishes, everything that a person accomplishes in life, I'm sorry, occurs between these two terminal moments, between birth and death. Normally, we look fondly toward births, but we dread death. We like the beginnings, but we don't like the end. Both births and deaths are appropriate seasons as ordained by God. Verse 2 says, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. A time to plant refers to to our jobs, <clears throat> our work, and to make sure that we and our families have the necessities of life, food and shelter. Remember we looked at last week that God had told Adam and Eve that because of their sin they would have to work hard and by the sweat of their brow for everything that they ate and every piece of shelter that they found. Okay. It also says a time to uproot, as it's in, translated in the Christian Standard Bible. This refers to the fact that things wear out, don't they, though? <laughs> you, you buy a car, and before you know it, it's worn out. And we have to have it fixed. We have to have it replaced. That This goes on constantly without end. Nothing on this earth lasts forever. Nothing. Look at verse 3. It says a time to kill and a time to heal. Now, whether we like it or not, we might deny this, but there are times for self-defense or national defense when we must arm ourselves and we must react according to God's will against evil, the evil that threatens our lives. These times are followed according to God's plan with a time to heal. Verse 3 says, also a time to tear down and a time to build up. The materials we use are not eternal either. These things have their own season of life and they wear out, they break down and decompose all a part of God's plan and order for His creation. Then it's time to rebuild. In verse 4, it says a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Sometimes a person will weep as an emotional reaction to something that either makes him or her very sad or very happy. I think I've always thought it's interesting that, that we, will, we will shed tears for the very, very sad and we will shed tears for the very, very happy as well. When a loved one dies with terrible losses, people weep or mourn. We mourn when we lose anything that's of great personal value. When children make bad life choices, where they lose opportunity in life, or, or when we receive a bad report from a doctor, which is a loss of our health. Everything on this earth is temporal, and thusly there is much mourning in this life. Because life includes so much weeping and mourning, people also need to make the most of the times that God gives us to laugh and to dance. We need it. God will also give us many occasions in life to rejoice, to celebrate, 
to have a good time, such as when we come together with our family at holidays, those that we love, and as fellow Christians, as we come together in our place of worship and lift up our praise to God together, we need that. It, we need that time of being happy together and feeling secure together. God has made us in such a way that laughter and dancing for joy nourishes and replenishes our souls and it rejuvenates our minds and our psyche. We need both. Let's go down to verses 5 through 8. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. There are times when we need to work out routine activity. Verse number 5 tells us a few things that the people of the day of Solomon probably understand very clearly. Let's look at this. The land of Israel is covered with stone. Still is today. Before anything can be done with the ground in Israel, hundreds or thousands of stones must be removed and cast away out of the field. Yet in Israel, stones are also the most abundant building material. So, to make any structure, stones of just the right sizes and shapes must be gathered together to build fences or boundaries and walls for buildings and houses. In verse 5, it also says a time to embrace and a time to shun embracing. Now, this is a very important lesson for us to learn today because one of the things that Solomon, one of the ways that Solomon sought fulfillment was through sexual pleasure. Our society is trying to escape through sexual pleasure. And this tells us that there is a beautiful time in the life of a married couple when they embrace for the purpose of creating their family through new children. But there are also times in the lives of couples when they must be apart or shun the embracing and focus on the hard work and the vitally important business of raising those children while holding together our family unit. It's important that we know the season that we're in so that we know how best to find fulfillment in that time. Okay, verse number six. It says a time to search and a time to give up as lost. A time to keep and a time to throw away. It was the custom in the ancient Near East to tear one's clothing as a sign of personal sorrow or grief. But in those days, clothing was very, very valuable. You spent a lot of money buying your, the cloth to make your clothing. So, if you tore that clothing in time of grief, it's going to be necessary to re-sew, okay, that's, R-E-S-E-W, to re-sew that cloth when the period of grieving has passed and the path toward recovery must begin. We must leave behind or throw away the old lost life, pick up the pieces, and begin a new life after a suitable time of mourning. So important 
so important to know mourning is going to come in each person's life. And we need to learn how to cope with it. The same is true of receipt of our personal salvation in Jesus Christ. Every person must come to the decision to throw away or repent from the old life that was dedicated to sinful practices and to turn, make an about face, to turn to the gift of new life and be born again, if you will, in Christ Jesus. It is important to note that the teacher began this poem with the bookends of birth and death. Now he summarizes the time between birth on one side and death on the other. And he summarizes in his last two lines. Look at verses 7 and 8. He says, a time to tear apart and a time to sew together. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Christians are taught in Matthew chapter 5 especially not to hate other people, but to hate the things they do. But we are told in Scripture that there are things which God hates. God hates sin, and He hates rejection of His gift, His free gift of salvation through His Son, Jesus, i.e. choosing instead to follow a, a life of evil. From last week's lesson, we learn that the hearts of those who fear God are conformed to the heart and the will of God, thusly, they will experience times when we will hate the sin that is going on around us, recognizing its terrible, terrible consequences. There is a constant spiritual battle raging around us. We read that especially in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, where we're told to prepare ourselves each and every day for the spiritual battle that we will face. We have no choice in the matter. Whether we like it or not, we will face that spiritual battle. Sometimes this unseen spiritual war erupts into the physical world at, a, at which time God will call upon His children to wage war in the physical realm. There's a sense in which we have little to say about the resulting seasons of our life. None of us wants to go to war, ever. So how we face these seasons is vitally important. And that's the, that's the main theme of this lesson today, is how do we face the seasons of life? Now we can view these seasons in two ways. Okay, number one, we can view our time as oppressive. That is, we have no control and we live in fear of what will come next. We live in a world of anxiety. Okay, number two, we can view our time as an opportunity to trust that God is always in control and to know that all things are working toward our personal sanctification. Our, God is working on us as we fear Him and as we believe in Him. He's working on us through all of these things that happen in our lives to make us more like Him. He's sanctifying us. And this depends how well we're sanctified and how quickly we mature in God is how we respond to these seasons in life. We can trust in God's will for our life 
and become his instrument for helping those around us, or we can take the stance of a helpless victim and become even more bitter toward God. In Romans 8, 28 and 29, we read, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. Okay? This has to do with how we react to things, okay? Things will work together for good. All things will work together for good if we know how to live by faith in God. Verse 29, for whom he foreknew, in other words, those who, who have already repented and turned their lives back to God and away from evil, pursuing evil, those whom God has foreknew, foreknown, he has, for, he has predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn to them of all the brethren. Jesus is above all. He is our Lord. God uses all things in life to work together for our good and to conform us to the image of His Son. God intends for us to redeem all the seasons of our lives, to redeem them all in our life for God's purpose, to understand what God wants us to do in each and every situation that we encounter in life. That's what we should be seeking. What is God's will in this matter? We should be praying when we have troubles in life. We shouldn't be praying to God, why in the world, God, did you make this happen? Instead, we should ask the question, Lord God, why have you brought me here? What is your purpose? What do you want me to do in this situation? We come down to Ecclesiastes 3, 9 through 13, and we can and find enjoyment in life. Every person can. Verses 9 through 11, we read, What profit has the worker from that which he labors. I've seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their heart, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. Verse 9. What profit has the worker from that which he labors? Now, the Hebrew word for labors can also be translated struggle. So you could translate this this way. What profit has the worker from that in which he struggles? The hard things, the big old heavy rock that we have to pick up once in a while. This reveals the demanding nature of life in our hard work or our labors in this world, people endure and cope better with struggles and hardships in life better whenever we see a purpose in what we are struggling to get through. People tend to lose hope if we sense that our toil is in vain. And for no worthy cause. Verse 10. I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. Meaning in life has to be discovered beyond the realm of human activity. We can't just keep looking more at the stuff that's here on earth to find meaning in life. We have to look to God. He is the only one that can help us understand. Whatever we do in life comes to us as a gift from God. God controls human events and time to accomplish and complete 
His purpose. Even the routine and mundane responsibilities of life are filled with a divine purpose. Though people are not able to see the whole of God's plans for our lives, we must trust God and make sense of events as they happen in our lives. Far from the sense of futility when life is examined apart from God, God has assigned a purpose in life of every single person who gives his life to his son, Jesus Christ. I'll say that again. God has assigned a purpose in, to the life of every single person who gives his life to his son, Jesus the Christ. God's design for your life is complete and perfect as it is woven into the fabric of his overall purpose in the world. Verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, He has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. God has a master plan for your life and for my life. If you belong to God, and if I belong to God, then everything which happens in our lives is a part of God's plan for us. Even the bad things? In its time, can be rendered correctly as in His time, in God's time. God's plan for my life and your life has beauty as it fits with His eternal redemptive plan. He has put eternity in their hearts, in our hearts. God has placed in every human mind an inherent understanding of a personal transcendence that's beyond this time, this lifetime which is not bound by time and is an everlasting aspect, an eternity that's built along with us. The eternal God is the one who transcends both space that we live in and time. God has also placed in every human mind an inherent understanding of the existence of that one who is eternally self-existent and far greater than us, the Lord God, the great I Am, the Lord, Yahweh is His covenant name in the Old Testament. We then long to know that one, the one who is eternally self-existent, the one who is outside of all space and time, who has control of our eternal destiny. When we long to know our lives have eternal meaning, that everything that happens does so at an appropriate way, in an appropriate way, and at the appropriate time. According to a divine plan, the way of God Himself has predestined for us. All of God's work is indeed beautiful. Genesis 1, 31. We each have a built-in desire to look beyond the limits of our lives in this world for answers to the ultimate question, which is the meaning of my life and the meaning of your life. God has made a way for people to find Him to live in covenant with Him, and to know Him personally through Scripture and prayer, and understand much of His purpose for our lives. Except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to the end. Christ Jesus tells us that He is the way to God. His Father, according to God's eternal plan, He is 
He is the pathway through which we can come to know God, to have a relationship with God. To The Hebrew word for can find out means to find out by searching. The, from the Bible, from the very beginning in Genesis all the way to the very end in Revelation, God in, that, in His word promises that he who seeks me will find me. So there's a desire that we need to, to find out what is the way? What way does God want me to go? God exists outside of time. He sees all events of the earth and the works to bring all to himself. In 2 Peter 3, 8 through 9, we read, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. In other words, God puts up with a lot that we do that's wrong. And He does this because He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and to find eternal life. There is a constant tension between wanting to know the eternal and the infinite in God's plan for our lives and being able to only see a small portion of it. This tension can make people feel trapped in time, but it can also compel a person to draw nearer to God for support and direction and understanding. This longing given by God invigorates people to contemplate deeper spiritual truth. We should always be humble toward God and seek His guidance and direction in our lives. There is a divine, eternal design for each and every life. There is a divine and eternal design for each and every life. You and I are called to place our faith completely in God and trust that only He knows what is best for each and every one of us. Only God knows what is best. Such that if we are staying near to God and following Him closely, when things happen in our lives, we know that they happen for God's purpose and for God's reason. That we know this is what is best for us. And it gives a purpose to everything that happens. Verses 12 and 13. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice. And to do good in their lives. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is a gift of God. Nothing is better than being content with God's will for your life. Do good and seek God's righteousness. Otherwise, we're falling into sin's trap. We're chasing a purpose that we cannot attain and actually striving against what God wants in our life. Since we can trust God to conduct the affairs of the universe in a righteous and timely way, we are free to do good in our living. The good life is a life of submission to God and directed toward doing good for others. Pleasing God by helping other people. This brings real joy. Rejoice in that. As Peter said, or, or Paul says in, in Philippians chapter 4, he says rejoice. I say rejoice in that. And as God gives us opportunity to bless other people, strive to find and be content 
and enjoy the life God has given you. Do not seek after something which God has not given you. That's Philippians 4.11. God's will for you is the life which is fulfilled. That's God's will for each one of us, is to have a fulfilling life. Enjoy that. James 1.17, it says, Every perfect gift is from above. Every perfect gift is from God. Every lasting gift is from God. Ecclesiastes 3.14-15 I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing can be taken from it. God does it that men should fear before Him. That which has already been, and what is to be, has already been, and God requires an account of what is past. God asks, what are you going to do with this? I'm blessing you greatly. I'm giving you great things. What are you going to do with it to make this world better? But the words eternity in verse 11 and forever in verse 14 are translated from the same Hebrew word. They both mean a time in the past, present, and future. Okay, All God has... I'm sorry, all God does has eternal significance. All that humanity does is temporal. It just lasts for a little while. As a part of His work, God has put an understanding of the existence of and a desire for eternity in our heart. Only what God does in our lives has an eternal consequence and an everlasting reward. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it by any person. God's way is perfect and it is eternal. Seeking God's work in in the lives of people for eternal purposes gives us a correct view of God. God does it that men should fear Him, that men should respect Him. Knowing that we are and who God, knowing who we are and who God is gives each of us an awe and an absolute respect for God and for His work. Every person should be afraid or fear to go contrary to God's will. For that reason, we need, to, we need to always be trying to find out what God's will is in every matter. We should be praying that way. We should be going through God's word and searching the scriptures for that answer. What is God's will in this matter? God is transcendent. He exists outside of time and space. He alone oversees time and eternity. Now as we kind of come down to verse 16 in our passage, it reads, Moreover, moreover I saw under the sun, in the place of judgment, wickedness was there. And in the place of righteousness, Iniquity was there. The Hebrew word for iniquity means twistedness. Okay, In in the place of righteousness, twistedness was there. As As Solomon looked at the world and the things that people were doing, he saw even in the place of judgment, the, the, the court system, there was a wickedness there in the court system. And in the place of righteousness, there was twisted thinking. In verse 17 he says, I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time there for every purpose and for every work that God has ordained. Okay, And God finds that people are not seeking His will at all, but doing their own thing. 
which is creating more problems for other people. In verse 16, it says, in the place of judgment, and then he mentions also in the place of righteousness. The Hebrew word translated righteousness refers to what is right or appropriate according to God's perfect holy standards. And it carries the idea of conforming to God's prescribed norm. For God's covenant people, the Lord expects His people to conform to His plan according to His law and His ordinances. The place of judgment found under the sun refers specifically to the court system or the whole within a society. In verse 16 it says that oftentimes what we find in our legal system is wickedness. Okay, And that's because the rules are twisted. Iniquity was there. Wickedness refers to violence, crime, and unethical behavior in places in the judgment, in the place of judgment, in the court system. There's, there's violence and crime and unethical behavior. What can we expect as a result? It, what was being observed also by God that in the place of righteous judgment, in the place of Righteousness was violence, lawlessness, and injustice. Solomon saw wickedness thriving where judgment was expected, indicating how hopeless life without God becomes. Except that things are devoted to the righteous ways of God, the wheels are going to come off in our society in our systems, in our places of judgment. In verse 17, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. Solomon ponders here the certainty of divine judgment, wondering if it was the only real solution to the problems in his nation in his day. God himself will judge all people, good or bad for their deeds on this earth. There's also the promise of God's judgment, good or bad, on the nations of this earth. Apart from faith and the divine judgment of the wicked, is there any hope for our nation as we wrestle with our injustice? 2 Chronicles 7.14, a timeless verse. Listen to it carefully, United States of America. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Period. Nothing more, nothing less. The only society that will stand the test of time and flourish is the society that remains humbled before or led by God through faith in His Son, Jesus. There's a time there for every purpose and for every work of judgment, both of individuals and of nations. We see that in verse 17. This is similar to the wording for the work of man on this earth in verses 1 through 8. But here it is with, re re with reference to the certainty of God's judgment coming down on this earth. God will not allow any injustice at His final judgment here on this earth. God is perfect in His love, but God is also perfectly just. God has already set the time for His judgment. If we as individuals and as a nation are willing to repent and believe in His salvation from sin, then we will be saved. But if not, when that time of judgment comes, we will be condemned and we will receive 
are just punishment. In chapter 4, just a few things I want to point out. It says in verse 1, Then I returned and considered all the oppression that was done under the sun. The oppression. The oppression. And look, the tears of the oppressed. But they have no comforter. On the side of their oppressors there is power. But they have no comforter. Look down in verse 4. Again I saw that for all toil and every skillful skillful work a man is envied by his neighbor. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. This is wanting something that the other person has instead of trying to find God's will in my life and and making sure that I move toward that and receive God's blessing. The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. Better a handful with quietness than both hands full together with toil and grasping for wind. Let's pray. Father, we we hear these words. Lord, we we look around us in our in our world and in our nation and we see the truth in these words everywhere we look. Lord, we see we see signs of your judgment beginning to fall in our nation. Lord, we see signs of your judgment beginning to fall in our neighborhood. Lord, it is a scary thing to think that, that we may be getting very near to the precipice. But Lord, you promised that if, if your people will just repent, will do an about face, will turn around from following our own ways and seeking with all of our hearts to find your way, then you will forgive our sins and that you will bless us again. Lord, we as believers, we pray for this with all of our heart as we recommit ourselves to serving you and we try to keep our eyes and our spiritual heart focused on you hearing your still small voice guiding us in everything that we do in life lord speak to us speak to our hearts show us the ways that you would have us to go and we know lord that that is the place where we will find fulfillment, where we will find glory and honor in this world, Lord. And we ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ.